Okay, it is um, it is now six thirty. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, and because I do want to keep it short and sweet, don't want to go too long. And I do have Ryan Robertson, my business partner, on with me. Um, he's uh, his main job tonight is to make sure that that I don't ramble or go too long, because I think many of you would attest to the fact that uh, I, I like to talk about the markets, and I I definitely can get deep into the weeds. So. So that's his main job tonight is to make sure I don't, I don't ramble too much, but uh, yeah, we'll keep it short and sweet. And I I think we'll have a lot of fun. I'm excited to talk about, you know, some of the, the different options that we have available in the marketplace right now, strategies and tools that maybe people aren't used to using or haven't looked at using yet. So, so we'll dive into that. Uh, Again, just a little bit of house cleaning. Again, we're gonna keep it to 30 minutes. We'll go short and sweet. Uh, We are going to record this. So, I don't know if there's any like legal things I need to tell you people, but yeah, we, we are recording. Um, and so that way, if anybody wants to watch part of it back, you know, or if you want to share it with any friends or family or anything like that, it'll, it'll be available after the fact. There is an option for uh, Q&A. So at the bottom of your little your little Zoom screen, there's a Q&A button if you want to uh, post any questions. And, you know, Ryan will, if, if we get a good question as we're going through, Ryan will stop me and we'll, we'll address it. We may have some time at the end. If we do, we'll we'll answer some of those questions. But if not, again, you know, this is this is more of a, a special webinar meeting for you know for our clients. And so, you know, obviously you guys know how to contact us, you know how to get in touch with us. And so we're we're happy to you know, answer more questions down the road. So um yeah, we're we're really excited. And then um yeah, like I said too, everybody's muted, all cameras are off, so you don't have to. You don't have to worry about anything like that. And we're not going to randomly unmute you. So, so don't be afraid about anything like that. So uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And, um, you know, as we as we dive into this, like I said, you know, feel free to use that that question and answer box if, if something, you know, if you want to know something a little more. Because what we're going to do, so we're going we're gonna to talk about some topics tonight that are, you know, a little different from your, your regular stock and bond. Um, we are going to talk about current market conditions. I do, I do want to spend a few minutes there because you know, obviously there's a lot of, a lot of turbulence and volatility in the market right now. And I, I do want to talk about some of those things that we're seeing. And then, you know, as we do talk about some of these strategies, I think that that can be helpful to, to change your, not to change your portfolio, but to round out your portfolio um, and, and, you know, add your portfolio along the way, whether it's now, six months from now, five years from now, you know, I think these are definitely tools that what I like to tell people really helps to build the perfect portfolio. So we're going to definitely talk about that. And we'll talk about some of the specific attributes. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds with the specific nuts and bolts. We will, we'll, we'll dive pretty deep, but like I said, take notes. Um, think about questions you may have. And, and if you want to, obviously, anytime myself, Ryan, or any of our other advisors, we're happy to dive in deeper and, and you know, really kind of kick the tires on these these different strategies. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, so let's talk about market conditions. Uh, again, I appreciate everybody being on. In fact, it's kind of cool. We've got... Um, we got people on from all across the uh, United States. So this is pretty fun. We've got definitely all time zones are represented. So, you know, people staying up a little bit later and and people just gotten off work. We appreciate y'all joining us. This is this is exciting. So, um, and and the cool thing about this is is these are the reason I wanted to really build this webinar is we've had you know so many questions over the last six months. We've had a lot of you know people asking about hey what are some other things I should be looking at. And also people wanting to know what is going on in the market. What, what do we, you know, what do we think is going to happen? Things like that. So, so it's really cool to have everybody together and be able to, to talk about some of these things. So, all right. Some of the concerns, market conditions, let's talk about what they are. First and foremost, the thing that everybody's talking about, and we probably hear, uh, you know, at least probably every day. And, you know, for a good little while there, everybody was definitely feeling that pinch at the uh, at the gas pump, and that's inflation. So I recently 
um, you know, my wife and I, we run our household just, just like a business. And I was recently reassigned, uh, you know, one of my, my job functions in our family and I'm doing a lot more of the grocery shopping now. And, um, I definitely noticed it's funny because when I first started, you know, taking over those duties the last few weeks, last month or two, my wife started making fun of me because the bill was a little bit higher. And I was like, Oh, come on, you know, I'm, I'm learning the ropes here. But, you know, as we really kind of sat down and looked at, at our, our receipts, it's, it really is. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing that the cost of groceries is, is definitely gone up. So, you know, we're feeling that everybody's feeling it, the pump, the grocery store, you know, goods and services are just more expensive. Uh, one thing that I would say that's nice, well, not, not I mean, inflation rising in, in any way, shape or form is, is frustrating. The nice thing is, however, we're starting to see it cool off. In fact, uh, just the last couple of weeks we've seen, so and, and not to get too deep in the weeds, but you know, there's there's a few different ways we look at inflation. There's the overall total inflation. There's what we call core inflation, which takes out gas and um, gas and food. You know, like groceries, things like that. It takes those two pieces up because there's so many other variables that affect the, the you know the pricing of of those pieces. Um, so the, the total inflation actually did start to come down. It's it's you know it, one of the first months we saw that piece come down. Uh, core, core actually still ticked up a little bit. So everything besides gas and, and groceries, those pieces did tick up a little bit, but what was really good, kind of the story behind the numbers is that the, um, the inflationary did, it, it was a lot, it wasn't as big of a jump as most analysts had predicted, which is really, that's a really good, that means a lot. So, so we're, you know, again, we're starting to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel, as far as inflation is concerned. Now, what that means for the you know real true day to day you know what we experience in the everyday life, who knows, right? I mean that's we, we we all still feel that sometimes. What I will say though, this is really important. So and I have I, I talk about this all the time with people. Look, we, we know inflation's super high right now. We get it, and, and, and to a large extent, we understand why. But what's more important to me, what I to always tell clients is watch what's happening with the five-year and 10-year forecasted inflation, five-year and 10-year, right? Look at those data pieces. And the reason for that is because, again, obviously the, the current data is going to impact that. The higher the current data, right, that, that, that forecasted you know, future estimate, that's going to be in, inclusive of, to, of today's numbers. And we're really seeing that stabilize. You know, before we were thinking it might be closer to 3.5%. Now it's actually stabilizing more around 2.5%, that five-year projection. So that, that's a good, a really good thing too, because again, if we can get that inflationary data to to cool down a little bit, um, you know, that's 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 a good place to settle over the next five to eight years. Um, obviously, we've we're coming out of a, a, a time frame of of some of the lowest inflationary data we've ever seen. So I get it; it's a change in life, lifestyle. You know, any inflation is kind of frustrating. But so, anyways, that's the current concern. The nice thing is we're we're working through it. Recession. We are in a technical recession right now, and essentially, you know, a true technical recession is you know two quarters of GDP contraction, right? Is it is it is it dropping? Uh, but and that's actually kind of the funny thing is you know is it a recession? Is it not? There's so many you know so many people going back and forth on this. I mean, yeah, we are in a recession, and so you know what does that mean? Um, you know, where are we going to go from here? Obviously, that's that's a big part of the volatility that we're experiencing in the marketplace. What is job creation? What are job lo loss numbers going to look like? You know, those are pieces that we have to be concerned with. Um, and, you, you know, again, inflation's cooling off, which is good, which will impact what the Fed does. The recession information, th there's still a lot of moving pieces with that. So, you, you know, I, I'm not quite at a place where I feel like we can prognosticate or really project a lot of, uh, you know, I'm not super optimistic whether or not this recession is going to be a, a quote unquote easy or soft recession or, or whether or not we're going to experience a little bit more. Uh, I, there's, you know, it's time I think we'll tell over the next few months. Uh, valuations. This is important to, you know, again, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds with corporate valuations in the data there, but th this is the one part that where I really am holding out some hope and if anything, I, I kind of feel like 
you know, we're starting to see even some some returns in the last six weeks in the marketplace. We're seeing some recovery, which is great. And that's coming from the fact that quarter to earning data, earnings data for, you know, if you look across, you know, publicly traded companies was pretty good. More, more than not, in fact, I want to say the number was about 60 or sorry, 75-ish percent, 80% were at expectations or exceeded expectations with, with what their forecasted earnings had been for, for Q2, which the Q2 was expected to, to be a bloodbath. So, you know, whether or not that's going to mean it's going to be delayed quarter three and quarter four earnings, who knows, but quarter three, quarter four data is still looking pretty strong too. And the idea is, okay, as long as valuations can hold, you know, we should weather the storm, right? But again, nonetheless, right? If we hit a recession, does that mean bottom lines are worse for companies? Interest rates are going up, so they have to pay more for their debt. All these things are going to affect those corporate valuations, which obviously in turn is going to add more volatility to the marketplace. Politics, right? I don't don't want to get too deep in into politics, but you know, there's a lot to be said for uh, you know political unrest right now. Things that we're seeing uh, in uh, you know in in foreign countries with China, you know, the war in Ukraine and Russia, uh, politics here, you know, here at home, domestic. Obviously, that has some impact, but. Um, Obviously, those are kind of the those are the big overarching concerns that we're seeing in the marketplace. So, you know, the million dollar question, and I and I put this picture up for a good reason because I think a lot of a lot of you on this this webinar and so many people I talk to are like, Ty, where are we going? You know, where's 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 the marketplace going to be? And and to be frank, nobody knows, right? Now, I, I will say, and I don't mean to be coy, but I will say. I feel very comfortable in data. I love data. I don't like noise. I've never subscribed to market noise. I don't like the talking heads. I don't like, you know, because I feel like most of the time those people are trying to sell something. Um, and if, in fact, if anybody does know, hey, hey, this is exactly where the market's going, they're probably trying to sell you something. So my point is, you know, we don't know, but obviously we can look at data, we can extrapolate, we can contrast, compare, we can look at historical stuff and, and get a good sense of it. But, but again, nobody knows. What I do like, though, however, is I want to ask the question, and I want you to all think about this. What can we learn? What is what is this uh, this this bear market we've gone through? Because a, a technical bear market just means from a peak to a valley, it's dropped twenty percent. Um, you know, from from the highs right around the first part of the year, January second, down to the lows. Uh, you know, end of end of June, part of you know, right into June, first part of June. Uh, market was down about 22, 23%. Uh, NASDAQ was down close to 30%. You know, Dow was down about 18%. So t- a true technical bear market, bear down, right? Falling market. Um, so again, you know, what, what's good about this, it's never good. Nobody likes to open up their statements and, you know, see loss. Nobody likes that. But what is good is it kind of rattles the cage a little bit. Because since January of 2016, when you, when you when you peel out COVID, which COVID dropped, recovered, I mean, that thing was was a crazy blip. Uh, reco- one of the fastest recoveries from a true uh, uh, bear correction that we've ever seen in the history of the marketplace. You, you pull that out, 2016 to 2021, end of 2021, early 2022, one of the strongest bull runs. I mean, you're talking straight up. So we kind of have been accustomed to this idea of markets go up. I should be averaging 14 to 20%. This is awesome. You don't lose. Put your money into tech, right? Meme stocks, right? Everybody's been buying meme stocks. Um, So I like these market. And that's the thing. This really has been, for all accounts, a healthy uh, correction in the marketplace. So again, what do we learn from this? That's what's so crucial here. Because remember, we can't control knowing what's going to happen in the future, but we can control what we learn from this. And what I want to talk about is we're going to spend the next, uh, okay, 15 minutes. We're going to spend the next 15 minutes talking about a part of what I like to call the perfect portfolio. Now, we're, we're an RIA. We're a registered investment advisor. We're fiduciaries. What that means is I can't, there's not a one size fits all ever. There's not. So, um, this specific perfect portfolio doesn't mean it has to be the same for everybody. There's going to be variations for, and even too, some of the people on this call, um, on this webinar, 
you know, I, I see vastly different types of, of portfolios. But again, what can we learn? What I like is 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 what I hope to kind of you know jog in your brain tonight is, you know, are there pieces or elements that that might make my portfolio a little less crazy, or you know, add some stability that maybe I wasn't thinking about before? And that's why I like to call it the perfect portfolio. And I use this analogy of this house because it's a very simple idea. So the first part is I've got real estate. So they're like the roof, real estate roof, right? I like to see people have 30% real estate in the portfolio. And that can be a lot of things. That can be owning properties outright. Uh, I mean, even using leverage. It can be, you know, uh, private re- REIT is a real estate investment trust. It's a, it's a portfolio. REIT. Private placements. I, a lot of our you know clients will use their self-directed monies to buy into private funds that are real estate focused. You know, there's a lot that we can talk about there. I like to see 30% there, right? The next piece is the structure, right? The actual like bricks, mortar, the sticks and bricks of the house, the structure or the stock, right? Your stock and bond. Um, That's another 30% of the portfolio, right? That's part of that perfect blend. And, you know, the thing is most people that I talk to, because it's coming from their retirement, from their 401k, they've just been throwing money in there you know, and the, the, the 401ks from your employer don't really have these other pieces. Most people are more like 60, 70, 80%. In fact, there was a study done recently um, on the average portfolio construction and it was like 69, 68%, 70% in that range of most portfolios is stock and bond. And people think they're diversified and it just simply isn't the case. Uh, alternatives I have at ten percent. So and and I've got it sitting next to the tree because the alternatives are hey look that's the nice like you want to have some nice curb or uh, not curb and gutter um you know like plant bushes landscaping around your house like that's not the landscaping doesn't really make the value of the home but it makes it nice it's the curb appeal right and that's the same thing with the alternatives your cryptos your oil and gas I mean you name it anything you think of that's wild and crazy right. Investing in businesses, it's nice to have, but it shouldn't really ever be more than ten percent. When I've got clients that are like, "Hey, I want to put 50, 60, 70 percent of my money into cryptos or things," I'm like, "You're crazy," but that's okay. That, that you know, again, yeah, to each their own. Uh, and the last piece we're going to talk about is is this fixed piece, and this is what we're talking about tonight: this fixed income piece. And, and the reason I've got it as you know fixed for F, it's the foundation piece, right? So let's talk about building our portfolios that have 30%, you know, in that foundation piece. So what is this fixed component? What is this income piece? Um, I want to share a quick um, acronym that I like sharing with clients, RSL. So here in the state of Utah, there's a professional soccer club, RSL. Uh, It's not that we're not talking about this professional soccer club. They have nothing to do with your portfolio. They're kind of a crappy soccer team anyways. Um, Although they did, they did win the, uh, the, the, the cup uh back in 2009 so that was cool for the state of utah but we're not talking about them rsl talks about return safety and liquidity and the reason i want to kind of shift gears for a second is as we look at those pieces of the perfect portfolio each of those pieces are going to cap or they're going to access part of of that rsl they're going to get one of or you know some of those pieces because what happens is you can never have all three pieces of rsl you just can't because if any, and again, if anybody tells you, hey, I've got an investment that's got an awesome return, right? You're going to make 15, 20 percent, totally safe, no risk of loss, and you can pull your money out anytime. They're lying to you, right? It's snake oil. It really is. I, I've, I've seen a lot of, you know, uh, I, I've seen a lot of ideas, a lot of stuff that gets pitched and sold in the marketplace. Again, the truth is you, you cannot have all three. You can't. You, you cannot, right? Um, so let's talk about it. So let's give you an example. So if we take out the safety piece and we just want return and liquidity, well, that's a stock, right? Stocks, you have obviously a lot of upswing potential and you can get out of stocks easy, right? You want to sell, you know, if, uh, if you bought a meme stock last year and you wanted to get out of that meme stock, you can sell it, whatever, right? You have that liquidity. So return and liquidity, but what are you giving up? You're giving up the safety, right? You don't have that safety. Um, what about safety and liquidity? You're giving up return. Usually, if you have something that's totally safe and fairly liquid, there's no return. That's why I've got money market here, right? So, like your money markets, your short term CD, like the, the average rate for a less than one year CD is like 
less than a quarter of a percent. I mean, you're not making anything. You're not when it, when we're talking about inflation, you're not even close to keeping up with inflation. So, so that's that piece. With the fixed income, with that foundation piece, what we're talking about is having good returns and some safety. So what that means is most often this gives up. In fact, a lot of times too, uh, you know, some of some of you on the line tonight, and some of you uh, on the webinar, um, a lot of clients will use their self-directed accounts and they'll invest in private private funds. And a lot of times I'll see private funds are like, hey, you know, we're going to give you, you know, twelve percent. Um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be good, right? Like, and and they're not bad; they're good portfolios. My point is, is a lot of times you have to lock that money up. Right. So um, anyways, just, just that, that's what we're talking about is we're talking about this piece where sometimes you have to give up a little bit of that liquidity to get there. Um, OK, so sorry, let me get back into this. OK, um, usually what we see in this piece, too, is there are elements of the fixed growth, meaning it's pretty easy to understand, OK, what am I going to grow? Also, it can generate income. And that's what we're going to talk about these two pieces tonight. And the idea behind that is, is it's kind of like the old days of having a pension. And, you know, and sometimes when I present this, I, we share a poll. I don't really want to spend a lot of time tonight, you know, sharing the, you know, talking about the, a poll. Um, but, you know, I like to ask people, how many of you have a pension? And, and really, the longer I'm in this business, the less and less and less I see pensions, right? The idea that, hey, I've worked for so many years, I'm just going to get a guaranteed cash flow for the rest of my life. What I'm talking about, some of these alternative, not alternative strategies, but this foundational strategy, we do have the growth, but we also look at income because it's so crucial with this. And the idea, too, that we talk about the strategies that we use with Prosper, with my advisors, the way I built it, the way I've been using these strategies for you know, nearly 20 years, is I, I never like, because again, it's the foundation. The foundation should be sure, right? You don't want your house crumbling, you know, if there's a small earthquake. So that's the whole point here is that there is no loss. And that's exactly what I'm talking about tonight is these pieces year to date, they've not lost anything. So let's I, I want to talk about some of the characteristics or attributes of, of these types of investments. Uh, what are the pros and cons? Uh, like we're talking about with that income piece, there's some of these strategies that can generate a cash flow forever till the day you and even your spouse till the day you both die. That is power because. With any business, the number one thing I've learned and the number one thing, you know, I did a bachelor's, a master's in finance business. I own my own business. I've been in business a long time. My parents owned a business growing up. The number one rule, cash is king. You got to have cash, right? So that's what's so powerful with these strategies is they generate a cash flow forever. There's also ways too, because a lot of times people will look at these and they're like, well, do I give up my asset? Do I get, if I give you, you know, a hundred grand, Ty, like, is that asset gone? Like, I, yeah, I want to generate cash, but like, I don't, I, I like the idea that, you know, if I buy real estate, I still have some assets there. No, you, in, in, in depending on how the strategy is structured, you do still get to keep your assets. So that's important. Cash flow and you keep the asset depending on how it's structured. Again, there's no loss in the market. There's these same kind of fixed strategies that can capture more of the upswing, but they have risk of loss. I don't use it. Never have used it. Right. And we'll talk about that in just a second. What are some of the cons? I want to, I, I do, I, cause I'm a big believer in you need to see the good and the bad every time. So some of the cons are the fact that returns are capped, meaning if the market, like, you know, the uh, last couple of years, it's been 18, 20, 25%. You're not going to get those kinds of returns. You're just not. Because if you're going to give away that 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 loss, you got to give up something else on the upswing. Uh, again, funds are illiquid, right? I mean, and liquidity, basically what liquidity means is you can't get in and out like a stock. You just can't. You, you got you, you to commit the money is a little bit more. Uh, and then the idea of control, like, like that, right? I mean, for the most part, you know, you as our clients, you, you trust us. We manage monies for you. We're helping control things. But even then it's like, in some of these situations, you're giving up a little bit more of your control to, to outside sources. So um, I like this analogy too. With, with a lot of times with this foundation, the idea is you don't get you, you can't have the whole cake and eat it too. You don't, you don't get the perfect all total 25% returns and no risk of loss. You got to give away a little bit of it. But 
you don't have this. You don't have the year where it's like 2008, where it's like, uh, or even this year, right? You don't, you, you, you're never faced with this idea or like crypto people that have been, you know, heavily involved in crypto. You're not losing out on all that. Um, I want to get to another piece of the slide. We've, we've only got about five minutes left. So I want to make sure I get to some other pieces. This is a breakdown of, of, of a growth strategy and an income strategy. And, and anyways, I'll, we can go, I can go through this later with people, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, but um, I want to show for the last few minutes how this stacks up because that's what matters at the end of the day is like, you know, Hey, tidies are great ideas. Let's let's, where does the rubber meet the road? What does this actually, what, what does this do now? I will say, take all of this with a grain of salt, okay? Because, it, it, and anytime any of you want, you know, me, Ryan, any of us, we're, we're more than happy to dive into all the details. And you all know that we're an open book. So, so take all this with a grain of salt, because what I hate happens sometimes is sometimes people get really excited because um, <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, these are awesome. This is so cool. This is the greatest thing in the world. And they kind of have this idea in their mind that this is, you know, it's, it's, this, this returns can be up here. So, but temper the expectations a little bit. All right. So let's look at, okay, all these different stories. We're talk about a few different strategies. Going back to 2000, right? The turn of the century dot com bubble bursting. If you started with 100 grand, let's look at a few different strategies where you'd be. This actually goes through, um, these, all this data. I pulled all this data through the uh, end of July. Okay. So if you're in the S&P 500, started with 100 grand, 285,000. If you were consistently rolling a five-year CD, you're sitting at 113 grand. If you did the aggregate bond index, you're sitting at 109, 110,000. That's where you're at after 22 years. This fixed strategy that I'm talking about, and that's a little light blue, so sorry if it's hard to see on your computers, that's $263,000. Um, and that's, that's actual true historical data that I went and pulled from some of the, you know, some of these strategies we use. So again, is it the S and P 500 total full market returns? No, but what's interesting, what I want to show, let's pull out the last six months, S and P 500. It, uh, so July, we had a little bit of recovery again, it bottomed out and that graph doesn't really represent that the market bottomed out and kicked back up a little bit, but it was down 13%. Um, if you looked at some of these fixed portfolios at the, from the first of the year, they didn't lose anything. So again, it's, it's, it, it, the idea is, is, is learning how to incorporate these strategies together so that, Hey, look, you want, like I talked about, you want monies in the market. Cause the last few years when you made 25 or 30%, that's awesome. But also like right now, when we're seeing more, more volatility, this is great too. And the thing is too, I still have clients posting greater than zero returns right now. Because it, it depends on the timing of the year and things like that. But my point is, you're not losing. That's what's powerful. Um, let's look at it versus some property. Because I love real estate. I love, 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 love real estate. Again, we're going to, you know, we've only got about three or four minutes left. Uh, and maybe I'll go a few minutes over. So bear with me. But I love real estate. I think it's, a, that's why I do the self-directing. That's why I love it. Because I think everybody needs to build this perfect portfolio. So 250 grand. Let's look at 250 grand in a couple of different I, I options. So, so this first option right here that I just pulled up, this is one of these fixed strategies that's, that's purely focused on generating cash flow. And you can see, uh, we turn it on in year five, okay? You can see that that does deplete your assets. So, so your assets do, but I mean, it's, it's the same thing as if you had stocks, right? You're pulling money out of your stock accounts, eventually that's gonna be gone. The nice thing here is if you live to year 20 or to year 30, 20, that income never goes away. That's the beauty of that cash flow. This is kind of a hybrid where you still have the fixed asset, but you're also generating. So you can see the, the bottom line, and, and that's what you're seeing right here is, um, and hopefully you guys can see my little cursor right here. This is the cash flow on the right hand column. The left is the value of the asset. So you can see here in the second one, you know, you still have some assets at the end of 20 years, but the cash flow is a little bit less. Now here's a property. Again, in all three of these, what we did is we put 250000 in to the deal. And where is it sitting at the end of your fund? So obviously, you know, the asset piece of the real estate, the cash flow piece, they're both very nice. But what I'm saying is, if you look right here at these previous two strategies that, that fall into that foundational piece, right? That's what I'm talking about, having all those pieces together. So people ask me all the time when we talk, when we go through these things, they're like, well, Ty, which one do you want? Which one's better? My point is, 
in the right portfolio, you have both of these. Because again, with the real estate, all of you, a lot of you will attest to the fact you got to work for it. And and real estate is not as easy. I mean, again, it's great. I, I, I'm not back on real estate. I love real estate. I own property myself. I love it. I want more of it. But I also use these other strategies in my portfolio and for my clients as well, because again, the idea is having true different systems, right? Because for this 675,000 right here on the far left, you're not doing any work to get that money. In this hybrid strategy, same thing, no work. The real estate, you're doing some work. Which is better, which is worse. My point is they're all very powerful when used together. So uh, so let's just kind of recap really fast. Um, and we are out of time. I was hoping, sorry, we do have you know quite a few questions that have popped in. Um, like I said, you know how to get in contact with us. I'm gonna put some information up in just a second, but. Um, you know, we're happy to answer any of these questions in person in time. But uh, just to recap, the markets are the markets are crazy. Um, you know, I mean, nobody nobody knows for sure where it's going, right? Like we talked about before, no, nobody has that crystal ball. Nobody does. I, I consider myself a very um, in in the details, in the weeds kind of uh, kind of a, a, ma a manager, right? I don't like I literally live in the markets every day. Uh, and I have some great ideas of where I think things are going. And I'm actually pretty excited where, where I'm seeing markets go. But that doesn't mean that we're, uh, you know, that nobody knows for sure. But what we do know is we do know how you can learn from this idea and have that perfect portfolio. And the idea is, uh, is, is utilizing some of these fixed strategies, right? You're, like we talked about this perfect portfolio. So that whatever storm hits your proverbial portfolio house, you don't really have to worry about that foundation crumbling. You don't have to worry about the walls blowing off, the roof blowing off. When you've got all these pieces together, you you really do have the the the, the right portfolio. So, um, we're one minute over, and Ryan didn't even have to chime in once to uh, to. That's a good thing, Ty. To, I know, right? I was surprised. I actually had, had had thought you would jump in before and, and tell me to, to move things along. But uh, seriously, we really appreciate everybody joining. Um, you know, we'll do some follow up too. If you've got questions, uh, you know how to get a hold of us. And, and like I said, there's that information right there. But uh, uh, thanks again for joining. We really, really love and appreciate all of you. It's funny because I, I always people hear me say client friends, right? And I, I, I love. I love these everybody that we work with. We Ryan and I we had a lot of fun working with all of you, and so um, like I said, we're planning on on we'll we'll, we'll do these more often and, and a little more with a little more frequency. So uh, you know, hopefully it helps helps all of you build perfect portfolios. A but have more more peace in as it relates to your finances. So um, yeah, so thanks again everybody for uh, you know for joining us tonight, and you know we appreciate your time. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.